This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Recently in Memphis, Tennessee, a freight train slammed into an automobile and carried it along the track for 60 yards before the woman driver was able to leap to safety. But according to newspaper reporters, this woman, age 20, suffered only from a split lip. And it's funny about that lip, she said later, I was so frightened, I think that I bit it after the wreck with the train. That is classic, because it illustrates a principle which is true for every person on this planet. It is your fears, nervousness, worries, and anxieties which are causing you your greatest pains in life, not the accidents or even calamities which may befall you. Some of the greatest victories human beings ever win are the victories over these very fears and worries and doubts. You were created to live in vital faith in God. You were created to live by inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide, created to live assimilating nutrients through your digestive tract. But you were not created to live in fear. That is simply antithetical to your human nature. Jesus did not fear criticism from those scribes, Pharisees, and elders who sought to trap him. Jesus did not fear tradition. He overturned the money changers' tables. Jesus did not fear work. He labored as a carpenter and spiritual teacher, and he did not fear death. He died affirming the very love of God. I remember one university student once argued to me that religion was only primitive fear, that early men were afraid of earthquakes, volcanoes, storms, lightning, and religion was based on that sort of primal animal fear, but that argument is devastated by Jesus' declaration, fear not, be not anxious, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The joy of life is finding and knowing God and living fearlessly, living in faith. But why religion, someone might ask? Why not just live your life and draw your breath every minute and your paycheck every two weeks and get your eight hours of sleep every 24 and be content with that? and nothing more. Why not? Why not? Because you can't be content just with that. That's why not. Why do you suppose there are so many suicides among the ranks of the rich and the famous and the powerful? Because power, wealth, and fame are simply not enough. You have a soul. You are a soul, know it or not, possessed of a body, and you need faith for the living of your life to live it valiantly, vitally, and well. You need religion, and you need, above all, to find God. You may think that nobody loves or respects you, but that may be simply because you have so little liking or respect for yourself. You may even detest yourself, but there is one in this universe who does love you and loves you boundlessly. I remember one time talking with a young man who had hitchhiked out to California from Connecticut, and as we talked, he was asking me how it was possible to believe in God, in spiritual things, all the time, without doubting. With soul-felt certainty, how is it possible to be always aware of the presence of God? I replied, it's more than just belief. It is more than the mere intellectual theory that God cares for your life, more than a dead doctrine or a memorized creed. It is an experience. Faith is is an experience. By faith, you can literally experience and know the love of God. This young man desired to believe that. He wanted to believe it intensely. I could see it. I could sense it. I said, what you need to do is become aware of this spiritual dimension of your life. Realize that you have a soul, that you are a soul, the living spirit of God indwells your mind, that there's a spark of spirit, the pulsating presence of divinity inside of you. Jesus declared, the kingdom of God is within you. And you don't have to scan the skies looking for God. God is as near to you as you are to yourself. And you can't get any closer than that. God's spirit is within you. As we talked, this hitchhiker and I, his eyes began to brighten with a certain sense of wonder and a degree of awe. And I particularly remember what he said when I told him that he could live in this experience, that his life is wrapped in the love of God. You know what he said? He said, wow, which puts it eloquently. Think of that. You too are a son or daughter of this universe, a child of God. You're not a cosmic orphan. You belong here. The Father of all loves you, and by simple faith in this everlasting God, you can begin to live your eternal life right here and right now, this very moment, as a beloved 
son or daughter of God wrapped in this living love of the living God to which anyone would rightly say, wow, that is tremendous. That is a life-transforming truth. Now, I just said all of that, repeating what I had said in this conversation with an East Coast hitchhiker, but it doesn't mean that I personally understand all of that either. Someone may say God is a complicated subject, of course, certainly, but the beauty of it is that you can come to know such a complicated God by such a simple faith, and you can. But then you fell in love with your first boyfriend or girlfriend the very same way. You may not have known all about where that person was born, what school that person attended, nationality of the great-grandparents. You may have fallen in love with your first girlfriend without knowing any of these things. You may not have known how many fillings she had in her teeth, whether or not she had her tonsils out, had passed her driver's test the first time, whether she had mumps as a little girl, what her favorite food was, exactly how tall, her shoe size, how much she weighed. You may have been abysmally ignorant of all of these things, but also have been utterly in love with her. You could love her because of what she was, because of her inner personality. I speak to the men in the radio audience. But the reverse is true. You don't have to know all the details to love the person because of whatever it is that makes that person. A person is what is lovable. That's what you recognize. This is precisely how it is in relationship with God. You can know God even if you don't know much about God. You could sit around all your lifetime wondering how long is eternity, how wide is infinity, how old is God, how can God be everywhere at once, what does it feel like to know everything that ever happened anywhere, wondering how God ever went about the process of creating this entire universe of universes, and you can speculate endlessly on such questions as these. But if you let the fact that you can't answer those questions keep you from the personal finding and knowing of God, then you have made the most terrible and tragic mistake. What if back in high school or during your college years you had absolutely and adamantly refused to go out on a date with someone unless you first had access to a complete and notarized file of facts about that person. Great lengthy questionnaires about family and genetic background, upbringing, every grade ever made in school, kindergarten conduct record, whether he or she still had an appendix and so on. Peculiar, you say. Of course. If, as a condition to getting to know someone, you first insisted you had to know all about that person, you wouldn't know many people, and perhaps none at all. So with God, you and I may never know all the facts there are to know about God, but we, though we be mere mortals of this earth, can know God. We can know God himself as a vital, dynamic, spiritual experience here and now. I said here, spatially, now, temporally, this instant, this time and place, that you're hearing my voice on the radio, is the time and the place, the here and the now, that can be the very turning point of all your life by faith. If you will utilize the measure of faith which you possess you can come to know God and begin to live in the delightful consciousness of your sonship or daughterhood with God. It can begin with you this instant if you will choose it so. Paradoxical as it may sound, you will never know who you are until you know who God is, that God is your father. You are kin to the creator. You're a child, a son, or daughter of God. You are valuable. You're not here by accident. You're worth something. There's a plan for your life. There's a purpose for your existence. There is a future for your life if you will give your life to God and have the faith to believe it. These things, as incredible as they may sound, as exaggerated as it may seem to say your life can be transformed by the love of God beginning this instant, nevertheless, it is true. Do you know that an adult grasshopper can jump 10 times as high as its own body length and 20 times as far as its body length if a man or a woman had that same jumping ability of a grasshopper, he or she would be able to leap over a barn in one single bound? And you say, well, that's amazing but not really because a grasshopper was designed to be able to leap that far. 
Comparatively speaking, some people are amazed to hear me say on the radio, you can actually know God. Not just know about God, find God, but know God, get to know God, talk with God all the time, through the day, share your life with God. But that's really not so startling if you consider the fact that human beings were designed to know God. In fact, we were thus designed by God himself to know God. We were created to know our Creator. And you'll never feel really right, really complete, replete at home in this universe until you find God and know it. On one occasion, Jesus said, the Father himself loves you. End of quote. Now, if that had been the only thing that Jesus of Nazareth had ever said in his entire career, if the crowds had come and assembled and waited for hours to hear him give a sermon or a speech, and if he had stood up or sat before them, as was the Oriental tradition, and had said only that one sentence, had that been the only truth he had taught, it would have been entirely well worth the wait. The Father himself loves you. Perhaps the single most important statement he ever made, more than anything else, you need to know that the Father himself loves you. And knowing that, you then can love your Father and love one another and bring peace on earth and goodwill among men because how are we going to have peace without that first ingredient of goodwill, of transformed hearts, of loving humanity, reborn by the love of God? God is your perfect and loving spiritual father. You can experience this life-transforming truth through decisions and actions of your personal faith. All people of this planet are brothers and sisters in the Father's spiritual family. God has given an actual fragment of himself to live and dwell within each one of us. God has a will for your life, which is the greatest possible good for your life. And if you'll choose to seek this will, there lies before us an eternal adventure of striving to attain the supreme values of truth and beauty and goodness. The ultimate goal of our existence is to reach for the very perfection of our Father in heaven. Be you therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, said Jesus. But finding and knowing God can begin for you in faith this instant. The choice is very simply yours. Write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. For free literature on the spiritual life, write to Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. That's Box 3080, Oakhurst, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell this mailing address. Box 3080-3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide wide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.